Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we get started, since everyone loves my dad jokes so much, I've got one for you. Oh no, my daughter says. Does anyone know who the first orphan was in history? Joshua, the son of Nun. Do I get a chuckle? Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad I, got, I've, I at least got one good one. Thanks, bro. I appreciate that. Okay, so uh, this, morning, this morning we have a unique opportunity. To, some things are different in church this morning. If you were here last week, um, this up here was white. Today it's red. Um, if you were here, that, cro- that cross is, is backwards from the way it normally is. Just little things that are different. But something bigger happens today. It's not just about the red on the altar. It's not just about the, the, the funny cross difference between one side and the other. The, the big difference today is today is a special day in the life of the church. It's a day that we call Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost, it's 50 days after. So 50 days, roughly 50 days after uh, Jesus rose from the dead, we have this day. Now, this day is important because it was a day that the disciples waited for. It was, a, it was a day they longed for. They, they wanted this day, but they had no idea when it was going to come. All they got from Jesus was a promise. And the promise was, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. You're going to get the Holy Spirit. So, so picture this. Okay, so we've got this event. Happened last week. We talked about it. It was a day known as the Ascension. Picture this, you've got the disciples up on top of a mountain, and Jesus is there, and then this cloud comes down, and and it takes Jesus up into heaven. We call that day the Ascension. Last week, I referred to it as the Heavenly Hoover, where everyone said, Eureka, because he died, son. Never mind. That's it. Okay, I promise. That's the last joke, and my daughter can stop rolling her eyes now. So so the ascension, and here the disciples are. They're all on top of the mountain, and and Jesus ascends, and they're sitting there with their faces hanging out and looking up going, what in the world are we going to do? But then one of them remembered. They had this thought. They're like, Jesus said, when I go away, I'm going to send my spirit. When, when, when I go away, my Holy Spirit's going to come and overpower you, and you're just going to like, you can't miss it. And so picture this, the ascension happens, they all go back to home and, and they have this prayer meeting and they're sitting down in their house and they're praying and they're singing their worship songs and whatever and all of a sudden one of them's like, I wonder if it's going to be today. Like Jesus just ascended, they're like, how long does it take to get to heaven? Probably there by now. Spirit, come on. And nothing. You, you, you want to know what happened the day Jesus ascended aside from the ascension? We don't know because there's nothing else recorded in the Bible. Nothing important happened that day. And then there's the day after. And so so the day after the ascension, they're they're all gathered and they're they're praying in their house. And they're like, okay, so so maybe today will be the day, right? Day two. Nothing. And then one of them, it's probably Peter. I'm sure one of them nudged the rest and was like, I got it, guys. Third day. It's got to be on the third day. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. I'm sure the Spirit's coming on day three. So they're like, come on, Holy Spirit, let's do this. And they weren't Lutherans, so they could raise their hands a little higher. But So like, they're like, wait, come on, Holy Spirit, you got this thing. Nothing. Day three, nothing happens. And day four, nothing. Day five, nothing. Day six, nothing. Then they're like, I got it. Day seven. Creation, seven days, sevenfold gifts of the Spirit, all the sevens in the Bible. It's got to be on the seventh day. So seventh day, they all wake up, and they have their eggs and whatever else they had for breakfast, and they're out there hanging out, and they're like, yeah, buddy, here it comes. Really? Anytime? And nothing. Like, did you get him? Did he come into you? Like, did it, maybe I missed it. Nothing. And then day eight. They're like, okay, so, so seven is the, day, is the number marking the, re, the, the creation. The number eight is the symbol for new creation. So maybe it's on day eight. Day eight rolls around and they're like, come on, nothing. And like, could you imagine being the disciples in this time? Because nine days isn't that long. Ten days isn't really that long. But when you are lost and alone, when you have nobody there, when you're waiting for something to happen 10 days is an eternity. And so there they are. On the 10th day, 
And you could almost wonder, did they just kind of give up on the whole idea? By the 10th day, were they just kind of going through the motions? You know, Lord, send us your Holy Spirit. I'm sure it's going to happen one of these days. Who knows when it's going to be now? It wasn't on day three, and it wasn't on day seven, and it wasn't on day eight, so whenever. And then it happens. And our text for today is Acts chapter 2. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1. If my tech crew could put Acts chapter 2 on the screen, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, kind of throwing you a curveball this morning. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost, now the Greek says, had fully arrived, as opposed to half or partially arrived, which I think is a weird way to say that. But when, when the day of Pentecost had fully arrived, so the sun's up, the rooster crows, it's the day, like it is the day. And they were all together in one place. So here we are, we're, we're 10 days after the ascension. They've, they've been praying through this thing. They've been waiting. It's like, it's got to be time. And the day is finally here. The sun's up and everybody's going about their business. Verse 2 says, when, and suddenly. Now, first of all, nothing happens suddenly after a 10-day waiting period. If you've been waiting for 10 days, it's not a sudden thing. It's a, it's a gradual thing that happens, right? But here, it is just a a wham, kind of a moment. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, have you ever been anywhere near a tornado? Anybody? You can raise your hand. It's okay. The ceiling won't fall in, I promise. A couple of you, have you ever heard the word tornado before? Okay, the rest of you are just not wanting to raise your hand. That's just gauging the crowd. That's all we're just trying to gauge participation levels here. So probably more of you have, have seen a tornado than you actually admitted because you've all heard the word tornado before and you still didn't raise your hand. Okay, so, so picture the sound of a tornado, but no wind. Notice what it says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It doesn't say there came a wind. It doesn't say that there came this, this blowing wind that messed up their hair and blew their little fireballs out on top of their heads. It said that there came a sound like the mighty rushing wind. It's like a tornado with no damage. It's like a train with no trains, the sound of a train with no train. Like, it is this, this monstrous noise that happened all at once, and it came down out of heaven suddenly. Whoa! Sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So here they are, they're gathered, and they're, they're praying, and like every day, it's, it's today the day, is where's this Holy Spirit? Can I, can I have a little bit of him? Did you get him? Where, where is he? Day 10. The sound of this wind fills the room. Now, now to get an understanding of why this is really important, we probably understand why wind is used. The word wind is a word for you and me that just means wind. But see, when I went to school, I went to school, I learned Greek and I learned Hebrew, and there's something unique about the word wind in both of those languages. The word wind in both Greek and Hebrew, Hebrew is the, word, the language of the Old Testament, Greek is the language of the New Testament, in both Greek and Hebrew, the same word for wind is also the same word for breath, and it's the same word for spirit. So get this. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was formless and void, and the wind hovered over the face of the deep. The spirit, the breath of God hovered over the face of the deep. And then God made Adam, and he looked at him, and he's like, he's really cool, hips, lips, and fingertips, but he's not alive. And so he winded into him, he breathed into him, he spirited into him. Wind, breath, and spirit, all the same word. Ezekiel, we see it again in Ezekiel, where the, where the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God is present. And here in Acts chapter 2, we see the exact same thing. In Acts chapter 2, the wind of God blows over the house where the disciples are. And it's the sound of the spirit of God showing up. Like, it's one of those, like, you can't miss it now. After that moment, nobody in the room was wondering, is the Spirit here? Because, like, literally, it lit them up. Literally. Because that wind, that sound of the wind blew, and these little things that look like fire tags, you can go to the next verse, uh, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. So, so some people, like, we draw the pictures and all the cool little things, and they've got little little flames of fire on top of their head, and 
It doesn't say there's fire on their head. It says what appeared to be something that looked like fire appeared to rest on them. And so we have this this sound of wind and the appearance of fire, and then they do something really cool in verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Spirit to the point where they spoke fluently in languages they didn't know. That's really, really important. Now, uh, later on in this, you're, you're going to see that, we won't get there today, but if you read on beyond this, you'll, you'll see that the people gathered in the area, their number one reaction when they heard the apostles preaching was, man, these people are drunk. Now, I don't know, I've been around drunk people before, and I've never heard a drunk person speak fluently in any language, much less a language they were not educated in. Most of the time, they babble and make no sense. Here they're speaking fluently in languages they didn't know. Now this is important. It goes on in the next couple sections. We won't go there, but you can go back one. Sorry. It goes on in the next few verses that talk about all the different nations that were present, all the different people groups that were present, and all those ones that we, nobody pronounces right, so we just kind of like jump over them and think they're not important. But here's why those are important. Because what was happening on this Pentecost day, on, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came in, and the sound of the wind and the appearance of fire and speaking in these languages they didn't know, was the exact reversal of what happened in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11. We know it as the Tower of Babel. Remember what happened in, in Genesis 11? So here they are, the people all get together, and they're like, let's build a tower that reaches up to heaven. We want to become just like God. We want to see what God sees. We want to control what God controls. We want to, we want to speak as if we are God. And so they all get together. They, they bring all their wealth together, and they start building this tower, and it goes all the way to heaven because they want to be God. And so what does God do? They, they build this tower as high as they can possibly build it. And one of my favorite lines is, and God bent down or stooped down to look at it. I mean, how demeaning is that? They built the tallest tower they could possibly amass, and God goes, what is that? Like, <laughs> and so he goes down, and he looks at this temple, and he confuses their language, and he sends them scattered. And so they started as one people, and they tried to be God. And so God scatters them to the farthest ends of the earth. And now, now, God appears through his Holy Spirit and he brings his one people into the places where the people were scattered. You see, what what happens when, when the Holy Spirit fills our lives, when the Holy Spirit comes in and fills us from the inside out, we are able to do things we otherwise couldn't do and our number one reaction is the same every single time. When you are filled with the Spirit, you speak of God. If you are not, this is gonna, this is gonna be harsh for some of you, and for those of you who don't know me, I, I don't pull punches. If you're not speaking of the grace and mercy of God, I wonder if you're filled with the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit gives you one reaction, like literally there is one reaction to being filled with the Spirit, and it is speaking of the life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. If you read the entire New Testament after Acts chapter two, Everything is about the life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. Life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. Paul, that's all he talks about. Life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. Peter, life, death, resurrection, return of Jesus. James, life, death, resurrection, return of Jesus. John, life, death, resurrection, return of Jesus. Timothy heard about it. Titus heard about it. Everybody in the New Testament heard about it because that's all that mattered. Because they were so filled with the Spirit, they only had one reaction. Life, death, resurrection, return of Jesus. Period. That's it. This morning in our service, in just a few minutes, when, 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 when our young people gather up front here, and they're going to do this thing called confirmation. It's kind of weird, but I, I get it. You may not understand it. But it's a time when they can confirm in their minds and in their, with their mouths something that's been taught them for years. And they're going to confirm and stand up here and say, yes, this is what I believe. You see, what we believe happens is, is when 
when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit comes into us, and there's a moment in our life when we recognize the working of the Holy Spirit. There's a moment that happens when we recognize the indwelling of God's Spirit, much like the Pentecost event. See, they already had the Holy Spirit before this event. Before Pentecost, the disciples already had the Holy Spirit working in them because when Jesus was in the room, or when the disciples were in the room and Jesus appeared to them, he breathed on them and said, receive my Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit. Long before the Pentecost, they already had the Holy Spirit. But this day is different because this day is unmistakable. This day, everything changed, and this day they couldn't stop talking about. Today, I pray that you five young people are able to have a day you don't stop talking about. I pray that today you, you remember what happened in your baptism when somebody spoke words for you. I pray that, that, you rem, that you go back to that moment. You may not remember it, but you've seen it happen a, a bunch of times probably. It's a day when somebody stood there and said, yes, this child will be raised believing these things. And confirmation is when you stand up here and you say, yep, that's me. This is mine. I can't stop talking about it. I'm not going to stop talking about it. I may not speak in all these other languages, but I know that I am going to proclaim who God is, how I can, wherever I go. Now, some people get hung up on the languages bit. Because, like, maybe you don't know foreign language fluently. Here's a quick one. How many, this is, you're all going to lie, so I don't know why I even asked the question, because you won't raise your hand anyway. How many of you can fluently speak in another language? Really, Wayne, for serious. <laughs> Are you fluent in all dialects, right? Yes, very good, right? Okay, so, so nobody knows how to speak in a foreign language. Okay, I'm sure that somebody does. Um, okay, so here's the thing. So don't, don't get hung up on this, right? Because everybody in here knows how to speak another language. Everybody does. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end here in a second, but I wanna tell you a story about a friend of mine named Justin. Uh, Justin was a, was a man who, who didn't know foreign languages. But he did, and he didn't realize it. When, when, I, first met, when I first met Justin, um, I said, hey, let's open up our Bibles to the Gospel of John. And he said, where's that at? And I said, it's in the New Testament. He goes, where's that at? It's the second half of the Bible? He goes, oh, okay. I'm like, here, page, whatever, because we had the same Bible. And we were talking, and we, were, we got to the topic of Mary. And he goes, yeah, wasn't there a, a really important person in the Bible named Mary? Like, that's where we started from. I'm like, yeah, yeah, dude, there was. She was kind of an important deal. Kind of a big deal. God kind of thought highly of her. Played a pretty significant role. And we started to unpack. And, and, and every week, we would meet together for, for hours. And we would go through scripture, and we would study scripture together. And, and it got to the point where he started to really understand the gospel. And he started to understand and know that, that the, the Bible is about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And I said, Justin, I think it's time for you to start telling people about Jesus. He goes, yeah, I don't know how to do that. But the more we started to talk, the more we realized he knew a language I didn't know. Now, Justin had this unique ability. He could tell you the stat, the statistics for any sports team ever. Like, literally, I'm pretty sure you could ask him the year of the team, and he could tell you everybody who played on that team that year, and he could tell you if it was baseball, what their batting average was. He could tell you, like, li literally this dude was like a genius when it came to sports. And it turned to the point where he started to be able to communicate what he knew about Jesus using the language of sports. You want to talk about entertaining. Try to, try to hear people talk about Jesus using the words of football, using the language of baseball, talking about golf, and this guy could do it hands down. It was great. What language do you speak? Do you speak the language of, of lawn care, of parenting, of being a spouse? Do you speak the language of being a child or a student? Do you speak the language of sports? Do you speak the language of, of working with your hands or woodwork? Do you speak the, the language of pick it? Any of those skills, talents, and abilities that God has endowed you with is a language he's given you to speak so that you can have your own Pentecost event. So that you don't have to have this loud rushing wind and little fire thingy on top of your head and speak in a foreign language, but you can speak in a language that's important to somebody else so they can hear the message of the gospel in the places where you live, work, and play. But it has to start. It has to start with prayer. 
because the disciples were gathered in prayer. And it wasn't until they were gathered in prayer and humbled in prayer and relying through prayer that they were able to be filled with the Spirit. And so since it all starts with prayer, I'm going to close the message this morning with a time of prayer. And so would you pray with me as we pray that God would fill us with His Spirit and give us the ability and strength to speak and lead and live these courageous, Spirit-filled lives. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we give you thanks and praise for filling us with your Spirit. Now we pray that you would overwhelm us with that Spirit, that it would be unmistakable and undeniable all that you've done in our lives. Father, we pray that you would give us that measure of your Spirit that allows us to never stop talking, that allows us to, to be courageous in preaching and proclaiming and teaching and living out this message. And, and Father, I pray that wherever we go, you would allow us to be people who talk about the life, death, resurrection, and promised return of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.